Giving our whole heart to the Lord is difficult in times when the self and its desires of pleasure, entertainment, and money are so prominent. However, Jesus tells us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Welcome to Every Last Word, a radio and internet program with Dr. Philip Ryken, teaching the whole Bible to change your whole life. Today we continue our studies in 2 Kings and the life of the prophet Elisha by learning how we can refocus ourselves on the worship and work of God and His kingdom by looking to the love that He first showed us. Well, Phil, today we hear all about King Jehu. What can we learn from him about worship? Well, Mark, in our worship, it's important to worship the right God and to worship Him in the right way. And Jehu did a great job in worshiping the right God. We'll hear in today's scripture passage how he destroyed the prophets of Baal. But he didn't worship the right God in the right way because he continued the worship of God through golden calves. And it's a reminder for us to only worship God in the biblical way. Well, in today's message, you remark that Jehu will have some unhappy words put on his gravestone by God. What do you think Jehu's fate ultimately was? Well, Jehu's a man that served God in various ways, but what the Scripture says is that he did not keep God's law with his whole heart. And, of course, like anybody else, Jehu's fate is in the Lord's hands. I suppose I don't know what his fate is, but I do know this, that I haven't kept God's law with my whole heart either. But there is a promise in Scripture that everyone who trusts in Jesus won't have to stand before God in his or her own merits with all of our half-hearted worship and all of the rest of the sins we've committed. No, we will stand before God in the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And that's where we'll end in today's message. Thanks, Phil. Let's turn in our Bibles now to 2 Kings chapter 10 and listen to God's Word for us today. I want to begin with a very serious question, and that is this. What epitaph will they write on your tombstone? What epitaph will they write on your tombstone? I've been doing some research about epitaphs this week. It seems as if the Romans almost invented the epitaph. One of the standard Roman epitaphs went like this. I was, I am not, I care not. We contrast that very pagan and stoic attitude with these words, which come from the grave of Francis Appleby in Beddington in Surrey. I nothing am, I nothing have, I nothing care, I nothing crave, but that my Jesus I may see, and that he may be all to me. You see, what is written on a gravestone can say a great deal about where a person will spend all eternity. And so imagine then being given the opportunity to visit your own gravesite. Imagine walking up and down the rows of the cemetery looking for your name on one of those gravestones. And then imagine finding it. The first thing that you would look for surely would be the date of death. It would be hard to resist the urge to find out when you will die. But then the second thing you would look for would be the epitaph for that short statement of the meaning of your whole life. And what do you suppose then that it would say? If your whole life could be reduced down to a single sentence chiseled into the stone, how would it read? Well, what we find in 2 Kings chapter 10 is a most unhappy epitaph. We find it in verse 31. It was written by Almighty God, and it reads as follows, Jehu was not careful to keep the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. Or to put it more simply, as you might for an epitaph, he gave God a half hearted effort. Now what is surprising about this epitaph is that Jehu seemed very zealous for the Lord. In fact, I suppose he did much more for God's honor and glory than many of us will ever even attempt. 
What I want to do is simply to tell you his story and then to ask you one very simple question. When Jehu had been anointed to be king of Israel, if you remember what happened in chapter 9 by the prophet Elisha, and in keeping with a prophecy that Elijah had made many years before, Jehu removed Ahab's evil sons from the throne, and he had that wicked queen Jezebel thrown down from her high tower, and he did all of this in keeping with the command of God. We find it back in Chapter 9, verse 7, you are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master. The whole house of Ahab will perish. And as we come to chapter 10, we discover how Jehu finished that God-given task. His first order of business, of course, as is the case in the life of any king, was to eliminate the threat of any rival. So he proposed a contest. There were, we read this in verse 1, in Samaria, 70 sons of the house of Ahab, actually Ahab's grandsons. So Jehu wrote some letters and he challenged them to choose a champion, to choose the best and the most worthy of those grandsons and to set him on the throne and then to fight for the house of Ahab. Well, news of Jehu's military exploits had already reached Samaria, and the last thing anyone wanted to do was contend with him in battle. So when the letter arrived, the leaders in Samaria were terrified, and they said, if two kings could not resist him, how can we? So they sent news of their surrender. When Jehu read that they were willing to surrender, he saw that he had a chance to eliminate Ahab's house entirely. And so he sent them back a second letter. And what he said is very curious. It appears in verse 6. If you are on my side and will obey me, then take the heads of your master's sons and come to me in Jezreel by this time tomorrow. Now, what Jehu said was ambiguous. He didn't necessarily mean something like off with their heads. The word for head can also mean simply chief or leader. But in any case, the officials in Samaria decided to take him literally. And when the letter arrived, these men took the princes and slaughtered all 70 of them. And then quite gruesomely, they packed their heads into baskets and sent them off to Jehu in Jezreel. The baskets arrived in the middle of the night and There was a question about what should be done with them, and so Jehu ordered that they be put in the city gates and put on display. I think this was not simply a scare tactic, although it certainly was that, but it was also a lesson in the fulfillment of prophecy. But the next morning when the people woke up, there were the heads, but where had they come from? Jehu went out to meet the people, and he stood before them, and he said, "'You are innocent.'" It was I who conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all of these? The point of Jehu's question isn't entirely clear. It sounds on the one hand as if he is clearing the residents of that city of any guilt for the death of Ahab's sons. There is a slightly different way to translate this verse. Jehu might have been saying something like this, You be the judge. I was the one who killed my master, but who killed all of these? The implied answer is that God himself has taken vengeance on the house of Ahab. He did it through human means, of course. But ultimately, this was the judgment of Almighty God. That's why Jehu says what he says next. Know then that not a word the Lord has spoken against the house of Ahab will fail. The Lord has done. You see, the Lord has done what he promised. Now, this was a bloody chapter in the history of God's people Israel. There are bound to be questions and even qualms and uncertainties we have about this passage. Certainly, we can be thankful that the kingdom of Jesus Christ is not ruled by the sword, but by the Spirit. We can be thankful, too, that God has not given us power over life and death the way that he gave it to his king, Jehu. At the same time, we must recognize that King Ahab received exactly what he deserved. 
He had set himself up as the sworn enemy of Almighty God. And therefore, he received, in keeping with God's law, that punishment which is visited upon the children for the sins of the fathers unto the third and fourth generations of those who hate him. Now, once Jehu had destroyed Ahab's household, he turned his attention to the prophets of Baal and destroyed his temple. Baal worship, as you know, perhaps, was very common in those days, so much so that not even Elijah had been able to get rid of it. Jehu was a very crafty king, and he started by pretending to be a Baal worshiper himself. This is what he said. He said, Ahab served Baal a little, this is verse 18, but Jehu will serve him much. Now summon all the prophets of Baal, all his ministers and priests, make sure no one's missing because I am going to hold a great sacrifice for Baal. And anyone who fails to come will no longer live. But Jehu was acting deceptively in order to destroy the ministers of Baal. His invitation is rather ironic. He invites everyone to a sacrifice. Well, there will be a sacrifice, all right, but not the kind that these prophets expect. Jehu very carefully baited his trap. All the ministers of Baal came. No one stayed away. They crowded into the temple of Baal until it was full from one end to the other. In order to identify these prophets more easily, he had robes brought out for them. And as soon as all the false prophets were clothed, he set the rest of his trap, put his military men around the temple, and then... Once a sacrifice had been offered, all of the prophets of Baal were slaughtered. The men went in, they took out the sacred stone of Baal, and they demolished it. They tore down the temple, and then finally, as if to add insult to injury, we read in verse 27 that the premises was used for a latrine. And in this way, Jehu finished that work which Elijah had only begun, not only to destroy the house of Ahab, but also to rid the land of the prophets of Baal once and for all. Was there anything that such a man would not have done to defend God's honor? In fact, we read that because of his great zeal for the Lord, Jehu received the Lord's blessing on his Kingdom, the Lord said, verse 30, you have done well. And for this reason, your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. And what the Hebrew literally says is that Jehu did what was in God's heart to do. You see, in some respects, Jehu was like David, a king after God's own heart. And yet, And yet there was this one thing which Jehu failed to do. Although he destroyed Baal worship in Israel, he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. Now, by Jehu's day, the golden calves had almost become Israel's state religion. People had grown tired of going all the way down to Jerusalem to worship, and so they set up a sort of seeker-sensitive service in Bethel and again in Dan. The king made two golden calves. This comes from 1 Kings chapter 12, and he said, It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. They set one up in Bethel and another up in Dan, and this thing became a sin. See, the idea was that you could still worship the Lord God of Israel, only you would use these golden calves to do it. But God is not to be worshipped any way we please. He is to be worshipped only the way that he pleases. In this case, he had given his people very explicit instructions, particularly about not worshipping any idols or any graven images. You see, for all of his zeal for the Lord, Jehu never destroyed those high places, and therefore God gave him this unhappy epitaph. He was not 
careful to keep the law of the Lord with all his heart. And you see, what is so sad is that Jehu failed to give God that one thing which he demands, and that is an undivided heart. Every morning, every man and woman and child in Israel recited this creed, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Whether he uttered this creed every morning or not, Jehu surely failed to live up to it. Yes, he destroyed God's enemies. He overthrew wicked tyrants. He opposed and defeated foreign religions. But he never gave God his whole heart. And this raises for us one vital question, I suppose, in a way. It's the question that matters more than any other question in the whole world. And that is this, have you given to God your whole heart? This is the one thing which God has always demanded. It's what he demands to this very day. A man once went to Jesus with a similar question. He said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. You see, the one thing God wants from you and from me is everything. All he wants is all you have, starting first of all with the affection of your heart. And the words of Jesus thus raise for us that same question, have you given the Lord your whole heart? Have you renounced every other love and affection? Have you confessed your sins and opened your heart up to the love of God which he has shown through Jesus Christ? The reason we need to ask ourselves these questions is because the church is full of half-hearted Christians. The Apostle Paul warned about this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. This is God's warning. Mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Now, when the Apostle Paul described these terrible times, he was not talking exclusively about people outside the church. No, he goes on in the very next verse to say that these men and women had a form of godliness. In other words, they looked like Christians. They knew a little theology. They had learned all of the right church vocabulary. They went to church. They were involved in a ministry, perhaps. Possibly they even read their Bibles and prayed every day. And yet, they were not lovers of God. And notice what they love instead. Three loves are mentioned in these verses. The love of self, the love of money, and the love of pleasure. These are precisely the sins which prevail here at the dawn of the 21st century, what you might call narcissism, the love of self, and then consumerism, or the love of money, and then finally hedonism, that is to say the love of pleasure. It would be hard to find three words which more accurately describe the spirit of our age, love of self, That now seems to be the basic premise of American life. You need to take care of yourself. You need to look out for yourself. You need to love yourself. One way to trace the growing self-centeredness of modern culture is through the titles of popular magazines. Back in the 1950s, one of the popular magazines was Life. Well, eventually people started to get tired of life and people wanted to read about people. And so they published the magazine People, and then 
Still later, they published Us. And then finally, a magazine for the 1990s, Self. Well, that's about as far as the love of self can go unless a magazine like me is already available on the local newsstand. Well, then you have the love of money. There are books about money and magazines about money, television programs about money. American culture mainly seems to be about the making and keeping and spending of money, even helping people know what to do with their money makes money. If you really want to see the love of money in action, watch what happens when the lottery jackpot climbs over $100 million. And then there is the love of pleasure. And I wonder if this civilization is the first in human history to turn pleasure into a business. We don't just entertain ourselves, we have an entertainment industry. And I suppose a good recent example of that was the tens of millions of people who tuned in to watch the final episode of Seinfeld, which after all is mainly, as I understand it, a program about the idiosyncrasies and inconsistencies of daily life. Its main point is the pointlessness of our daily lives. And therefore you have this spectacle of millions of people tuning in to find out how humorously meaningless their lives actually are. Well, the real problem is not this narcissistic, consumeristic, hedonistic culture. No, the real problem is that these three loves, self and money and pleasure, have stolen the hearts of God's people. Imagine for a moment what the church would look like if it loved itself, or if it loved money, or if it loved Pleasure. I think it would look pretty much the way that the church looks at this very moment. People in love with themselves would not go to church primarily to meet God, but to meet their own needs. People in love with their money would be stingy with their tithes and offerings, especially when it is compared to their actual income. People in love with themselves would be more concerned about what they get out of religion rather than what they put into it. If these things are true of the church, not to mention our culture, as I think they are, then we need to ask ourselves about the condition of our own hearts. You see, it brings us back to that question raised by Jehu's epitaph. Are you giving the Lord your whole heart? You see, if we are lovers of ourselves and lovers of money and of pleasure, then we must not be lovers of God. At best, what we are giving to him is a half-hearted effort. And you see, that is no way to establish a love relationship. God has made us to be passionately in love with him. It takes much more than half a heart to maintain a love relationship. Imagine a man who wanted to marry a woman on the premise that he would give to her half of his heart. I'll be around half the time, honey. I'll provide for about 50% of your spiritual and physical and emotional needs. Hey, what I do with the other 50% of my time is my business, but look, I'm willing to spend half of the rest of my life with you. What more could a woman ask for? Well, what about the other half of the man's heart? You see, that's no way to establish a marriage, and it is no way to live the Christian life. God wants all of your love, not half of it. When it comes to loving God, it is all or nothing. As the Puritans used to say, you cannot serve God by halves. No, the only thing to be done is to offer God your whole heart. I think of the way that John Calvin did this. You know Calvin's great prayer, I offer my heart to you, Lord, readily and sincerely. And really that's the prayer that sinners offer when they come to Jesus Christ in the first place. Here is my heart, Lord, readily and sincerely. 
But it's not just a prayer for the first day of the Christian life. It is a prayer for every day of the Christian life. It's the wholehearted prayer of every true lover of Christ. Lord, today I give you my heart all over again. Holding nothing back, I give you all of my affection, all of my desire, all of my heart. Now, perhaps you have discovered that such all-encompassing, all-consuming love does not arise naturally from the human heart. It doesn't come welling up of itself from within us. No, love does not come from us at all. It comes from God. And love for God can only come in the first place from God. That is why so many great Christian hymns are prayers that God would fill us with his love. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Or this hymn, Lord, It is my chief complaint that my love is weak and faint. And yet I love thee and adore, oh, for grace to love thee more. You see, if there is to be more love in our hearts for God, it will have to come from God. He is the source and the fountain of all love. And of course, this is why we must keep going back to the cross. Jesus died on the cross for our sins in order to show us and to give us the love of God. It was on the cross that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. It was on the cross that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if our love for God is weak, we need to keep going back to the cross for more and for stronger love. I wanted to close this sermon with another epitaph. I spent the week looking for one and making phone calls to get other people to help me look for one. I wanted to find an epitaph which expressed some believers' wholehearted devotion to Jesus Christ. Yet, I was unable to find one. I think the reason for that is our love for God is very weak. Like Jehu, the best we have to offer is a half-hearted effort. Who would ever claim to love God with his or her whole heart? So I want to propose for you another epitaph. It comes from Scripture, and it's a suitable epitaph for any Christian. Someday you might want to have it put on your own gravestone. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Amen. And let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we confess that our love for you is very weak. We need more of your love. We thank you that that love is available to us in Jesus Christ, who was crucified for our sins. We pray now that your Spirit would be at work in us to open our hearts to more of your love so that we might be more loving. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You have been listening to Every Last Word, a ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, featuring the Bible teaching of Dr. Philip Graham Ryken. We appreciate your ongoing support of this broadcast ministry. The Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview. Drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformation theologians from decades, even centuries gone by, we seek to provide contemporary Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. The Alliance also produces the radio broadcasts The Bible Study Hour, featuring the teaching of the late Dr. James Montgomery Boyce and Dr. Barnhouse in the Bible, featuring the Bible teaching of the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. 
For a full list of radio stations carrying our programs, please visit our website at www.alliancenet.org. Every last word continues through your generous gifts and financial support. If you would like to see this program continue to benefit others as it has benefited you, please prayerfully consider becoming a friend of the Alliance. For more information or to make a contribution, please contact us by calling toll-free 1-800-488-1888. You can also send us a gift by writing to Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at www.alliancenet.org. Be sure to ask for a free resource catalog featuring books, audio teachings, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support and for listening to Every Last Word.